<laughs> what? Start over. All right. Fine. Fine. So, um, as I said, I normally do a space uh, history, space flight history, rockets, that sort of thing. Tonight we're going to do something that different. We're going to focus on fiction. And specifically, the strange history of lunar fiction. Now, many of you have probably seen this still before. It's from one of the early science uh, fiction film classics, a French film, um, Voyage to the Moon, that was derived from the Jules Verne book. And, uh, you know, this was a technological wonder for its day that unfortunately bombed here in the U.S. because of pirating and kind of destroyed the um, guy who made it. But Jules Verne often gets credit for being a founding father of what we no. think of as science fiction. Uh, his From the Earth to the Moon was published in 1865. If none of you have read it, you might be surprised as to what the premise actually is. It's a tale of some Baltimore, Maryland-based gun enthusiasts in post-Civil War America. They go down to Tampa to launch their space gun. It's called Columbiad. Does any of this sound a little bit weird to you? <laughs> so, and he launched, they launched three people on the Columbiad, and it goes to the moon. Um, it is a touchstone in science fiction. The physics merited a rebuttal from um, the great pioneering Russian rocketeer, Konstantin uh, Solkovsky. In other words, you know, he said it wouldn't work that way. The parallels to the actual first moon landing in which three guys were launched out of Florida in the Columbia merited the Apollo 11 crew acknowledging this story as they were on their voyage back to Earth from the moon. Um, keep the whole Baltimore connection in mind, too. What year was the movie? The, I think this was 1902. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the book was six, 1865. Yeah, a little bit. So we're going to go a bit farther back into the past. So prior to 1865, the idea of humans going to the moon is, was developed by many of the notable authors of whatever era you want to pick. So you've got Dante there from Italy, or what is now Italy. He would have said, I'm from Florence. Thank you very much. The United Kingdom, the US, Denmark. Everybody developed the idea in their own way, and it was often oddly appropriate to the times. Everybody did their own moon story, as you'll see. And you might see one guy whose face is awfully familiar in there. That is Kepler, of course. We don't know him mostly as a author of fiction, but boy, did he make a contribution to the body of work. So let's talk a little bit about science fiction and science fantasy because many of these works are going to straddle the border between the two. So science fiction, I'm going to, I've got a couple of rules thrown out by great authors, um, but I'm going to consider it to be grounded in the author's response to the scientific and technological discoveries of their age and the concerns of their era. So we can put up with a miracle or two, what you might call the one piece of balonium rule, but if the whole thing is miracles, we're not talking about it tonight. So they've, they've got to have some kind of, unless it's actually a fairy tale, there are going to be some fairy stories. So I found this quote, it's from the guy who was the editor for the Amazing Stories literary magazine back in the 1920s, and I see he's got the three pillars of great man science fiction, Verne, Wells, Poe. Okay, fine. Charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision. That's actually a pretty good definition. But, as you'll see, the roots of that go a lot far back in the past compared to, say, Edgar Allan Poe. So let's start off in the year 1300. One of the cornerstones of Renaissance literature, the great epic poem known to us as the Divine Comedy. The most famous of its three installments chronicles poet narrator Dante Alighieri's journey through hell. Less known to us these days, or at least less read, is his ascent through the spheres of the classical heaven. So you see Dante <laughs> ascending there with his guide Beatrice, and you see this interesting piece of artwork of 
people in spheres. That is an artistic representation of his journey to the moon. The moon is the innermost sphere of heaven, as Dante tells it, so it is the first stop on his pilgrimage when he and Beatrice ascend from the terrestrial paradise. Here Dante meets souls who are blessed, but they are consigned to a lower sphere of eternity because they are, in a sense, flawed. They, in the case of these three ladies that Dante is meeting, they are nuns who were forcibly taken from their convent and compelled to marry <coughs> guys for political reasons, and they get kind of punished in the afterlife for this by not going to the good heaven. This might be why this is not such popular reading these days. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly less amusing than his account of hell. But So the theology is very much of its time. <clears throat> but the poetry is beautiful. So Dante's vision of the moon is the eternal pearl that receives Dante and Beatrice as water receives a ray of light remaining yet unbroken. I uh, kind of wish you all could experience it in the Italian, as I did when I was in college, because it is amazing, and most prose translations, or English translations in general, don't do it justice. So this is pure, gorgeous poetry. <clears throat> but this was his science. It is the uh, Ptolemaic spheres, the whole Aristotelian geocentric universe, and you've got Moon, Mercury, the Sun. The Sun is kind of the demarcation between the souls who are good but not quite so good and, and the really good people. And so um, Paradiso maps out the universe in great detail. It contains some stunning passages of what my professor called the numinous. It's hard to get your head around. It really needs to be read to be, read to be experienced and it's amazing fusion of the science, the math, the philosophy, everything at once. And the lunar chapter actually does a good job of illustrating the sort of headspace that you have to get into to begin to appreciate Paradiso. Dante goes into a hundred verses that explain what the shadows on the moon are about. And so he provides a rational pseudo-scientific answer, being a man of reason in this new era. He says, well, some parts of the moon are, some, are dense, <coughs> some parts of the moon are, are rarefied, and so you've got different sort of translucencies, and you see dark spots. And his guide, Beatrice, says, okay, very nice, but you're wrong. <laughs> and she rebuts his reasoning with her own reasoning, demonstrating why he's wrong, and <clears throat> guides him to the proper metaphysical answer as to why there are spots in the moon. The universe is God's creation, and you cannot understand Dante's moon or his Mercury or the sun or any of it without getting into the theology. So difficult work, very rewarding, and it's the cornerstone, as I see it, for all these other things that come after it, building one at a time. So skip ahead into the high renaissance, and another guy is turning his pen to epic poetry. Ludovico Ariosto. Well, he was inspired by Dante, as many were, uh, and he wrote an amazing poem that's very difficult to find in a decent English <coughs> translation. It's called Orlando Furioso, or Roland the Mad. Set in the time of Charlemagne. Charlemagne's got this great knight. The knight falls in love with a girl from India. He goes mad with love, and we have this great crisis as his knights have to figure out how to restore this guy's sanity. It's inspired writers from uh, Cervantes. It was, it was a formative influence of Don Quixote to Sir Walter Scott in the 20th century, Italo Calvino, Salman Rushdie. Very influential for other writers, not so popular here in this country, but globally. And it also inspired a good deal of art. This is a piece actually um, by Mantegna that inspired Ariosto. So you've got Renaissance art and Renaissance lit going in this wonderful feedback loop. And as I said, he, he plagiarizes Dante a bit, and we'll get into that. So why, why do we care about Ariosto? Well, ever heard about uh, the moon being made of cheese, right? Mm -hmm. 
Have you ever heard about everything that gets lost on Earth ends up on the moon? <coughs> Socks? Anything? <laughs> well, in Ariosto's universe, which is intentionally funny, he, he knew what he was doing when he made the poem as rollicking and memorable and funny as it is. Your last step goes to the moon. So there's a young knight named Astolfo, and he is looking for Orlando's wits. <coughs> he ends up in Dante's terrestrial paradise. The verses are basically stolen from Dante, not as good, but okay. He hooks up with Elijah and St. John the Evangelist. They hang out there. They're chilling. They're bros. Elijah says, hey, I can give you a lift in my flaming chariot. We're going to go to the moon. So they go to the moon in Elijah's flaming chariot. And the moon is a dumping ground of everything, concrete and abstract that humanity has ever lost. The size of lovers, the intentions of the lazy, um, the offerings of the ignoble, the hypocritical. If you wait until the very end of your life to give alms to the poor, there's a spill terrine of soup that could have gone to good use in your name up there on the moon. Um, like Dante, he wades into politics a bit, so he's got some offerings that we just would read. Okay, there's some flowers that are rotting, very nice. Oh, this is about Constantine giving the later in the palace to the Pope, that kind of thing. Well, fortunately, Astolfo, in the middle of all this trash, finds Astolfo's, uh, Orlando's lost wits, which are in the vial, helpfully labeled, <laughs> senses, and he comes back to Earth. So I've got a little sample of the text here. Um, Ariosto's conception of the moon is a place that is not a luminous orb of souls, but it's a planet. It's got wood, it's got water, it's got cities, it's got trash. It's a concrete place that happens to have all these metaphysical things going on. So even though Astolfo is hanging out with St. John and Elijah, we are inching towards science fiction at this point. Then, we get to Kepler. I don't think I have to explain who Kepler is. Anybody need a refresher on Kepler? Cool. Um, so Kepler, in addition to his laws of motion and his observations and his attempt to be bros with Galileo, which didn't work so well, he produced a work that's been hailed by Isaac Asimov, who should know, and Carl Sagan, who is the author of Conduct, also should know, as their idea of the founding work of science fiction. So we have been dealing up to now with the geocentric universe. Here is one of Kepler's steps in a heliocentric universe consisting entirely of platonic solids because that would be cool. Of course, he later <coughs> realized everything had to be elliptical. So Somnium, written in 1608, that's important, was not published anywhere near 1608, also important. If you can read the Latin there, it says posthumum. His son published it after he died. So, concerns a young man from Iceland. His father was a fisherman who lived to be the age of 150, okay. And his mother was a witch. Okay. That's why he lived that long. At age 14, our young hero stows away on a ship to Denmark containing mail that's destined for Tycho Brahe. He shows up with the letters. 14-year-old boy who's been seasick the whole journey, and the ship's captain's like, yeah, I got this kid, too. And Tycho takes him in and makes him his apprentice. <coughs> and for five years, the boy learns under Tycho the secrets of the universe and all that sort of thing. And then he gets a bit homesick and says, I'm going to go see Mom. So he goes back to Iceland. His mom is, oh, you know, you terrible boy. You never wrote me, etc., etc." And he said, I'm ready. I'm ready to learn from you, Mother. So she does a witch ritual, and she summons a demon. This is 1608. Giordano Bruno got executed eight years before. There's a reason this did not get out in his lifetime. Also, his mother actually had brushes with the law about witchcraft, so I think Kepler knew what he was talking about. <laughs> so, yeah, I was really Diane, shocked by the comment. comment? Was, I, I've heard that about Kepler. About yeah. his, he, he was in trouble quite often because... They thought his mother was a witch. Based on this, I would but, say but she was, was totally a witch. Was this before or after? <laughs> During. The whole thing. Yeah. She outlived him. 
she, she, she outlived me. So she was trying. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so her grandmother was executed for died. being a witch. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. But, sorry. Sorry for your. But like, based on what is in this text, I think he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> so the demon is not a demon like in Dante's Inferno. It can be construed as an extraterrestrial. It can even be construed in a metaphorical sense as the engine that conveys the earthlings up to the moon. So um, the moon takes, uh, takes four hours to get there. Uh, the he Kepler's worked out this whole thing about how they have to do the departure time. They have to time it during the lunar eclipse. If the moon becomes full while they're gone, they're never coming home. He's worked this whole thing out very beautifully. <laughs> And then he treats us to some lunar um, map, say. He's got his own glossary of terms. So the people of the moon call the moon Lavania. They consider it the island in the sky. Uh, it's 50,000 German miles up in the air, so you might want to keep that in mind. The people of the Lavanians look at Earth, and they call it vulva. And the people in the hemisphere that faces Earth all the time live in subvulva. The people that live on the dark side of the moon, which Kepler explains is not the dark side of the moon, is prevulva. So the prevulvans and the subvulvans all have their little culture going on. And here we go. So um, just as geographers just divide up in the zones, they've got the two hemispheres, they've got climate zones, they've got ice areas, etc. He put a great deal of thought into this. And honestly, it's short, it's readable, it's free on the internet in quite a few different places. I'd check it out. Out of all the things that I read for this, this is probably the most delightful. Not least because it's like, okay, this gives me some new insight into Kepler. But let's skip ahead a little bit to the next century over. United Kingdom, around the time of the Act of Union in 1701. You've got the Royal Society going full swing with science. You, so this is the era of Holly and Newton. This is the era that Swift is writing. This is the era of Daniel Defoe. So Daniel Defoe, like many of our lunar authors, got pretty heavily involved in politics. I didn't go into that with Dante, but his whole thing was he got so into politics that they kicked him out of the city. Well, <laughs> Defoe went to prison for a while. He, he got shut up in Newgate Prison. So he... He was a bit edgy. His pamphlets meant serious business, and his account of a journey to the moon is anything but a rollicking adventure story. It bears comparison to the third book of his contemporary, <coughs> Jonathan Swift's book, Gulliver's Travels, which is this whole thing about this floating island where he's taking pot shots at all the scientists of the day, you know, trying to turn poop back into food and that sort of thing. Definitely the weakest section of Gulliver's Travels, but mm, worth a read. Well, Consolidator, okay, so he starts off talking about the marvels of Chinese civilization. <coughs> then he goes into the part about the Chinese are so great because they got everything from the moon. Then we get to go to the moon in a winged chariot. Okay, well-established mechanism, get into the moon, chariots, yep, fine. Only this one has nothing to do with Elijah, it's an allegory. The two wings of, uh, represent the two houses of the British Parliament, the Lords and the Commons. <laughs> The feathers on the wings represents the members of the park. Okay, I, I was pretty much done with the book at that point. <laughs> this, it, this is hard going. I do not recommend this one. Excerpt. <coughs> I picked that because it was bad. Wait, did Gary Ross write this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so... Yeah, um, I. I don't really care about the Solunarian Church versus the Crowleyans or anything like that. Um, if you want to read a satire late Stuart era politics, go ahead. It's on Project Gutenberg. If you do read it, please take nothing at face value, including the praise for the Chinese, rather like Swift's essays that get misinterpreted. It's all very a modest proposal, sort of, yeah, don't believe a word he's saying. He's really angry about things. Okay, we're good. I'm just something a little more fun. Yes. Baron Munchausen. Uh, even he got in on the lunar hijinks. The Good Baron's Adventures, as related by the actual author, Rudolf Eric Raspe, uh, incorporated a lot of the new technologies in the era. So there was a caper involving hot air balloons that the Baron used to steal people's <coughs> castles and move them around while they slept and that sort of thing. 
Uh, initially, though, the Baron goes up in the manner of Jack and the Beanstalk. So he loses his silver hatchet, he wants his hatchet back, the hatchet into the moon, he climbs up a rope, he gets his hatchet back, he has a smoke, he meets some moon people, it's all good. <laughs> but he goes back, and he also visits the dog star Sirius, but we're not talking about Sirius tonight, so we're not covering that. But the second time around, he takes a boat. Sometimes it's rendered as an airship. This is an illustration by the great um, Gustave Doré, and he has a you know, full you know, Pirates of the Caribbean deal going up there to the moon. <laughs> In Lies Truth is the <coughs> motto, basically, of the Baron. So the phenomenon of the Baron real and fictionalized is kind of worth an essay in itself. It was a very fun part of the talk to research, but it was, most of it turned out not to be relevant. Um, if you prefer moving pictures, there's a film from the 1980s by, uh, yeah, okay, with Robin Williams as the Moon King. <laughs> I actually found the author pretty interesting himself, um, though overshadowed by his character. He was an interesting guy. He was a scientist. He got mixed up in dubious mining adventures in Scotland. Yes. He got elected to the Royal Society. He got expunged from the Royal Society. And Sir Walter Scott was so annoyed by this guy that he wrote in him as a character in one of his novels as a mining swindler. <laughs> so, fun times. All right, let's go across the ocean, shall we? Washington Irving. We all know about Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman, right? Rip Van Winkle. Anybody actually read Rip Van Winkle? Okay, everybody's read the Headless Horseman, right? Yeah. yeah. So you might remember that, even though it's generally thought of as like some kind of horror story. It's actually a keenly observed and deeply felt piece of social commentary. There's a lot going on in that work. Well, his Knickerbocker's History of New York, same thing. Satirical History of New York from the beginning of time to the end of the Dutch era. And embedded within it is a remarkable piece of early science fiction. It is called Men of the Moon. And it involves green-skinned, one-eyed lunar invaders with tails who drink liquid nitrous oxide in place of water. <coughs> we have thrown the switch into full-bore, recognizable science fiction. Not only that, he uses, makes copious use, of the great telling phrase of speculative fiction, let us suppose. <laughs> You see that in a book and it's labeled fiction, you're good. You see that in a book and it's labeled like the true history of China coming to the U.S. or aliens visiting Australia, you know, that one in the bin. So the capital L lunatics subdue the earthlings because they are just really appalled. They're white skin, two eyes, we don't have tails, we drink water, and our weapons are lousy. So they overpower us. They've got um, catapults, they have real moon rocks at us. They've got solar-powered guns that fire concentrated sunlight. We are toast. <laughs> it is a brutal allegory for colonialism. He did not like what the uh, Europeans did to the Native Americans, and he didn't particularly like what he'd heard of what the Islamic Empire had done to its subjects. So it is a full-on condemnation of colonialism in the uh, guise of a thought experiment. But it is good reading, and it has remarkable um, premonitions of other hallmarks of sci-fi. So, you know, Hollywood movie scenes, what always happens? They blow up the Capitol, they blow up the White House, they kidnap Colin Powell, whatever. Well, in this case, Emperor Napoleon, King George III, and President Madison all get hauled to the moon to pay homage to their new ruler. <laughs> so, in between the scientific trappings like the nitrous oxide and the social commentary, it's sci-fi. I, I see no reason to consider this anything but a founding work of sci-fi. And uh, the prose is a bit more readable than, uh, say, Defoe's era. So let us suppose that the moon people found this wild, savage place with nothing but beasts and stupid things. Well, they took it for the glory of the man in the moon, our, philosopher, our new philosopher king. And there is no happy ending. It, it's a lot like War of the Worlds, but there's no happy, convenient ending where the moon people die of the cold. You spoiled it. <laughs> now, we all know this guy, right? Mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe. He, he often gets credit for inventing science fiction. I think I've demonstrated the credit is misapplied. But he did take things to a new level. So. 
even if we focus purely on astronomy-based things, and not say Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or some of the other scientifically influenced works of the era, um, it's not the first science fiction story, but he went way beyond what anybody had attempted before with the unparalleled adventure of Hans Fall. It's a multi-level work that functions both as the literary hopes that it was and as a science fiction tale. So in brief, hot air balloon appears above Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Note drops down, the balloon goes back into the clouds. So the balloon is manned by this strange little two foot tall uh, kind of goblin-esque creature. The note proves to be the account of a journey of a man named Hans Fall, who had flown to the moon in a hot air balloon, cutting edge technology at the time, in order to escape his creditors. <laughs> and then he spent five years up there on the moon. And he sent the little lunar emissary down with the note to say, guys, I'll, I'll tell you all my story if you forgive my debts and give me a pardon. But unfortunately for him, when the little moon guy looked down at Rotterdam, all crowded with humans, who of course were huge by his, he panicked, he said, nah, and he just threw the note over and went back to the moon. So, um, Paul makes his account plausible. He fills it out with uh, scientific and topical references. Like, this is one excerpt he, excerpt he refused to. Professor Enki of the Enki Minima. He was up on the science. Um, another geologic sensation at the time, the volcano Cotopaxi. So he, he flavors it with all of these contemporary, interesting, sciencey things and a blizzard of technical detail on how this balloon works. Um, it's a bit dull going for Poe. Nobody's murdered, nobody goes mad. Um, the balloon is very technical and kind of dry. Maybe some of you like engineering types would like it, but I, I was bored. Are there any beetles? I don't remember. Um, though his account of the earth growing convex to his view as he ascends slowly and then the earth receding is pretty interesting because it does foreshadow what humans would not actually see for another hundred and you know, twenty years. So here's a piece, um, he's talking about the, how there is an atmosphere that extends to the moon so that all the critters can live and breathe and everything like that. Um, he leaves many tells that the tale is a hoax, so there's a whole lot of wordplay about levity and lightning and if you want to do your thesis on that, it's all there. I was like, okay, fine. There's some really obvious things, too. There's characters named Professor Rub-a-Dub. <laughs> <laughs> and since it's set in the Netherlands, Meinheer Superbus von Underduk <laughs> is not subtle. So it's not subtle enough that contemporary readers understood that this was not something that actually happened. This was a story to enjoy. It was a hoax, but nobody was really taken in by it. However, Poe being Poe with the terrible luck that he had, one good hoax deserves another. He published a short story in the Southern Literary Messenger. And the New York Sun responded with a six-part lunar hoax of his own, not just name-dropping Enki, but name-dropping the mighty John Herschel. And Herschel was said to have discovered fantastic life forms in the moon using a 24-inch telescope. It was a hit, so you've got the airship, you've got the moon critters, and Poe was not happy at all. So he submits his own balloon hoax to the New York Sun for publication, and people believed it. He did a much better job, but unfortunately that backfired on him because then he became known as a hoax guy. So he didn't really do too well other than the story was read and enjoyed by a French writer called Jules Verne. We'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in the old world, three short years after uh, Hans' fall, a different sort of lunar visit was uh, written by Hans Christian Andersen, who of course is known to us as a merchant of fairy tales. Little Mermaid, Steadfast and Soldier, Little Natch Girl, and other depressing things like that. <laughs> So his take on the moon was very much um, the European stock uh, idea of the seven league boots. So boots that are magical and you put them on and you go seven leagues. Okay, well, this is Hans, Hans Christian Andersen, the <coughs> metaphysical boots. They don't just take you 
seven leagues away, they can take you to the moon, or they can take you into the afterlife, or they can do all kinds of things, take you into another man's life. And of course, there's all these nice little moral lessons involved. So the character there on the right is a watchman. He's got his watchman's mace. And he is one of the victims of this pair of boots, along with a city councilor and a clerk and a theological student. So the watchman tries on the boots. The first thing he does is like, well, I have a lousy life. I wish I were that army lieutenant over there. I bet he has a nice life. So he's the army lieutenant. And then he reads a poem that the army lieutenant wrote. And the army lieutenant's like, my life is terrible, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, OK, I don't want to be this guy. Maybe I should be on the moon. So he's whisked off to the moon at the speed of light, which does exist. So I'm told. So <laughs> this is one of those signs that we're, we are in an era where you know the speed of light has been calculated by Ole Romer. It's not a science fiction piece, but he is using the language, the facts known of science at the time in order to get across. For instance, he cites that the moon is not 40 German or 40 German miles away, or what at 400 German miles away? 250,000, 240,000 miles. He, he knows these things by now. The science is <coughs> deeply progressed from Kepler's era, even if it's seven league boots with a metaphysical twist. Um, his take on the moon is kind of weird, too. It's uh, dazzling white, everything is soft as snow, or soft as egg white in this case. Um, the inhabitants notice the watchmen, they discuss amongst themselves how unlikely it is that there's any intelligent life on the earth. And um, the watchman, in the meantime, his body is sitting there holding his mace in the doorway. He's taken for dead, hauled up to the hospital, and he wakes up and is like, that was the worst experience of my life. Uh, fortunately, the misadventure with the boots doesn't actually leave him dead dead like it does with the theological clerk, but... Um, so there's... <coughs> Uh, references to steam travel, references to electrical shocks all in there. As I said, he's using the language of contemporary science, even if it is very much a fairy tale. Yes? And what's really interesting about this is that that last phrase there, like a huge dull red ball, tells you that people had no idea what the Earth looked like at all yes, from space. Yes, that's one reason I chose that. Yeah. No, they said it was a ball. Well, that's true. Okay, yeah. no idea what color it was. Right, no idea that it would be a blue ball or anything of that sort. So, uh, so we've come a long way in you know, 30 minutes from Dante's spiritual moon through early actual science fiction to an era in which people are comfortable enough with the science of the universe that they're using it in casually, in entertainment or children's stories with a moral. That means that the tropes of science fiction have been established. You're seeing in the 19th century balloons, lots of balloons. You're seeing certain tropes, if you will, which means that we have covered all these great men of literature. We can now go into some trash. <laughs> because once tropes are established, we can write trash. And this is really bad trash. It's basically a bizarre postscript to everything. So this is Cora Sem's Ives. She ha hailed from a well-connected southern family, a confederate family, who were really sore about losing the war. <laughs> so in 1869, Four short years after Jules Verne published his Civil War-ish, or From the Earth to the Moon, she publishes her own, pseudonymously, because she was a respectable lady, dedicated to all the suffering children of the South, by which she meant, of course, the little white children and not any of the suffering children of the slaves. Yeah. <laughs> the Princess of the Moon, a Confederate fairy story. Oh. Oh. It has been called a utopian novel given that the utopia involved is a clean-up version of the antebellum South, I think I would call it a dystopian novel. But the hero is a former Confederate soldier who is very upset that his plantation got burned. So the fairy of the moon comes down and gives him a winged horse. And he goes to the moon, and he meets the moon princess, and they hit it off beautifully, and he meets his future father-in-law, the moon king, and he's said, okay, everything's great. And then the balloons show up. 
hot air balloons, and there's bad people in them, Yankee carpetbaggers, with their carpet bags. Yankees. Even worse, they're accompanied by the, our hero's own former slave. This is bad stuff. <laughs> so the moon fairy gives him a new confederate uniform and a new sword, and uh, the carpetbaggers are scared off by moon dragons, and they drop the silverware that they looted from his plantation. So he gets his family silverware back. Oh, boy. God. All right. This was propaganda aimed at little kids. Oh, yeah. And he marries the moon princess, because of course he does. And there is their glorious sunset on the moon. It's one of the worst things I've read in a long time. I mean, the writing was clean, don't get me wrong. Clean, enjoyable writing. Defoe was a miserable experience. And I've read a lot of things from that era, but Consolidator is not his best. Very easy to read. But here's the thing. Again, once you establish the tropes, you can churn out any kind of garbage you want to, and it's going to hit on those touchstones that people, oh, yeah, okay, yep, yep, bad guys show up in hot air balloons. Hot air balloons to the moon. That's what we do, right? Hot air balloons. <laughs> um, not all science fiction is good science fiction. And it's also a particularly revealing case of uh, American myth-making. So since that was a really bad work, I'm going to end this with a modern comic that is a delightful thing that... Yes. Yes. So this is uh, it's from a, a comic blog called Hark of Vagrant. And so you've got Edgar Allan Poe getting this letter from this French guy who loves his balloon stories and wishes that they could be bros. So Poe and Jules Verne were, of course, never bros. But Jules Verne's whole hot air balloon from the earth to the moon set in Baltimore all very much a homage to Edgar Allan Poe and his balloon hoaxes. And from there we can go to H.G. Wells and uh, radio and movies and everything else. So. so I hope you've enjoyed this little journey through early science fiction. Okay, Jim first and Dale. This last, the last one of the Confederate yeah. lady writing reminds me of the very first science fiction book I ever read. And I'm old enough to be before you guys time. So not quite back as far as I would find it. <laughs> Robert Heinlein. Okay, yeah. Probably nineteen fifty. It was about uh, the Nazis that escaped the earth and went to the moon. And that was current stuff at the time because the police gazette was thinking that Hitler had escaped uh, in a submarine and went to South America. Right, right. But it was about a bunch of kids with their physics teacher who constructed a rocket to go to the moon. And when they got there, it was called Destination Moon. OK, they yeah, some yeah. Of you read it. yeah. When they got to the moon, they found it was full of Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the story was, a, was a story of, of them defeating the Nazis and so on. So which, again, very, <laughs> re <laughs> very representative of the concerns movie, uh, and technology of the time. Right. And at the time, you know, the V2 yeah. rockets Bingo. were big technology We've gone from hot air balloons to V2 Nazis rockets. Nazis had invented them and so on and so forth. Dale. I think you've sort of made the case that there was never a lack of imagination in these writers, but they had to wait for science to develop to write what became more and more recognizably science fiction. Very much. I mean, I would consider, I mean, Dante was using all of the scientific tools available to him in his era. <clears throat> and, and it was and just wrong. Try to look a little beyond science, mm -hmm. right? But nevertheless, their imagination was limited by science. Totally. Yes, Jerry. Well, uh, the thing that impressed me was that um, the story of the um, fiery chariot with Elijah in it. Well, in the biblical account, he never rode in a chariot. Uh, he was taken up in a whirlwind, <coughs> and the chariot was used to separate the two um, um, prophets. So um, you enlighten me where this idea of him riding a chariot comes from. It's from this imaginary fiction. 
Right. Well, I think it, I don't think it's the only source that used that, but it was certainly one of the most popular and influential depictions of. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, how how did he go up? Oh, a flaming chariot. I mean, this is also an era in which um, Saint John the Evangelist and John the Revelator and all that are kind of compressed into one character, so that it's not exactly in keeping with modern scholarship. Okay. Uh, Brian, and yeah. then uh, Ken, and then Jim again. Have you read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? Oh yes. What, very early, like what, what, 1809, something like that. Um, a little bit later than that, I think, but not much later. Okay. Anyway, um, there's nothing in it about how uh, the experiments were were uh, powered. You know, uh, in, in the movies, it's you know sunlight or, or mm -hmm. uh, electric. You know, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, it's generated by uh, lightning. Or chemical uh, energy of some kind, but you know, in the book, there's nothing about that. There's, I mean, just stuff about how they procured the bodies and body parts and everything like that, but nothing about how how it was all animated. Yeah, well, was in, 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 the, in films, just like um, most of the Frankenstein is a really good case, but a Christmas Carol, which of course is not science fiction, is another one. The most popular and enduring images that we have of these canon often have very little to do with what actually went on in the book. Yeah, just like yeah. You know, Dracula but and the whole, uh, you know, there's movies that, that perpetuate even, everything. Even without a, a means of animating the monster, though, I would still say that that book does have a good claim to be an early piece of science fiction, given yeah. the whole framing of it. Yeah. Of course, she was also grappling with big philosophical issues, like what do you do yeah. when you create a human being out of some yeah. parts? Yeah. And it doesn't like you very much. <laughs> yes, Ken? All right, uh, you know, I did a, a report on uh, Johann Kepler, and um, one of the things that I uh, discovered about a lot of things, he wasn't afraid of saying anything to anybody. And I believe that that transcript, which was published after he died in 1630, was probably a lost concept. Uh, 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 he was not the type of guy that held back. And he wasn't under the same influence that Bruno was. Even though it was eight years later, he was a Protestant. He was sitting in the... Uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, Roman Empire. He wasn't subject to the church. He was subject to that. And the problems with his mom were really instituted by a neighbor. And because of his popularity, he was given free ride. And that's why she didn't die at the, uh, on, the, on the stake. So I'm kind of skeptical about the fact that he probably lost that manuscript rather than uh, and it was discovered after his death. I, I, he was not a shy guy. That, that could be, but also, I mean, even with the Holy Roman Empire, the situation was pretty volatile. In fact, the framing device of Somnium is, this is during a time of conflict between the Archduke and the Emperor, and so there, yeah, there's I, that... I'd be, I'd be skeptical that he would. He came so out all right, would. but there's not a, a necessarily a guarantee at any given moment in time right. that things were going to be all right for him. He wrote a lot of stuff, so the point was that a lot of the things were, that, he, that were published after his death were discovered because he was like a, a squirrel who yeah. put things away. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. I, I would say that the, the details of the uh, demon summoning ritual were pretty... Um, <laughs> I would think that a lot of Protestant monarchs would not be okay with that either. Yeah, there's frankly. no question. They, 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 like, they, King they, James they, over in the UK, not okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> death penalty. <Yes. laughs> uh, Jimmy had another question. Oh, I was just going to, uh, hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> that's what happens. Oh, you, would, you, would you agree that uh, Jules Verne was probably uh, um, amongst all the folks of that ilk in that era, including in particular the, the, the rebel lady, was had paid most attention to the Newton's laws and the laws of physics. These, as I recall in his book, they were figuring out how much energy would be needed, how much gunpowder would be needed to get the trajectory to get to get us to the moon, and padding for for they didn't know the numbers, of course, but padding for, against the acceleration when the when the rocket ship was fired. And so oh, like. certainly. I mean, as I said, it was, it was, he put enough work <clears throat> into his trajectory for it to be worth a rebuttal for Russia's oh, yeah. foremost rocket scientists. I say, no, it wouldn't work that but way. But Sayakovsky lived 40 years later. Right. Yeah. 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 But the, the other comment was, uh, 
uh, I, in your research, of course, it was a different era, but uh, the uh, movie from probably 32, 33, uh, Frau in the Moon, The Woman in the Moon, by where Oberth was a, mm -hmm. was a scientific uh, consultant to the movie, was, was really a, a major thing that inspired the rocket movement of the 30s and 40s, you know, of, of, of Von Braun and, and all those guys. And I think that was, uh, the movie itself had a huge influence on, on the Europeans and, the, and even over here. Oh yeah, no, once you start getting to motion pictures, the feedback between what the movie showed was possible and what science caught up to yeah. is amazing. But, uh, yes, Jonathan. So in the, uh, if, if anyone remembers the great debate between uh, <laughs> about whether science fiction is a positive force in people's understanding of science, uh, one of the points made by the pro-science fiction contingent was that uh, it tends to inspire people to actually pursue scientific careers and to investigate certain subjects that came up as, you know, fictional originally. Did you see any influence from these works on scientists of the era? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not that I could cite. I mean, certainly something like Ariosto had a huge cultural influence that is very difficult to measure, particularly since it never really caught on here in America. Um, and something like, I mean, I found Washington Irving's piece absolutely delightful, but it did not come down to us as one of his most well-known. Actually, most of these are not the best work by any of the people involved. This is not Defoe at his best. It is not Poe at his best. Um, I would say it might not even be Anderson at his best. And uh, I found Irving's work delightful, but I don't know how many people read it or, or cared about that chapter of a very long satirical work that goes from being marvelously funny to dude has an axe to grind. <laughs> um, so it, it's really hard to say. I, I, I was more, more impressed by the way that it showed the dissemination of scientific concepts into the world at large to the point where Anderson, who again is not writing science fiction, is nonetheless deploying all these things because it is now expected. You will address steam engines. You will address electricity. You will address that electric shock can kill you. Uh, somebody writing a, a fairy tale 60, 80 years prior to that would not have needed to do any of that. But they had to engage with the technology of the times. And that was an interesting evolution to see. Not to mention the printing presses made people generally more literate. Oh, sure. I mean, well, there's, there's, there's a reason I concluded with outright trash novel. Yeah. We remember the good stuff. What everybody was actually reading was garbage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the most popular authors of the, and many of, much of what we considered to be the disposable garbage was actually written by women. You know, the most popular best-selling authors of the 19th century were not, you know, not necessarily the big names that we learn in, not Melville. He was not making money. There were women churning out trash novels that were making money. Yeah. How do you think history will remember Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> Can we get past the current whole thing with yeah. the... If only yeah. Jerry was let, here. Let, let, let's flash forward 15 years and see. <laughs> I don't want to touch Star Wars right now. Of course, any, and Jerry, anything written after 1965 is, is, isn't worth a damn anyway, you know. I'm sorry he wasn't here to see this. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> yes, Jeff. Uh, well, it's interesting to see the transition of like what the common accepted vehicle of getting to the moon would be from a chariot to a ship to a balloon to a bullet. Was like so in between balloons and rocket ships. Was there ever airplanes? Like was there a concept that you could literally just fly all the way? No, and actually, it's very interesting about the balloon because um, there was a piece published just this week in the Atlantic about how balloons went from being this apparent massive technological breakthrough that was going to change the world, <coughs> the hyperloop of its day, if you will, <laughs> yeah. to being this 
ridiculous novelty <laughs> that nonetheless had a very healthy afterlife in fiction because the idea of the hot air balloon was so compelling. So you're dealing with Poe and, and um, with Munchausen, with Poe, you're dealing with the after effects of balloon mania. And then by the time you're getting to Chorus Sam's Ives, she's just, that's what you do. You go to the moon and balloon or a winged horse, whatever. And so I didn't find a, a, a phase that, that um, was a precursor to the airplane, but the, the evolution of artillery that was taking place in the middle of the um, 19th century with the introduction of cheap steel that could be used to make steel guns, with the introduction of better ballistics, with the Crimean War and the American Civil War, that ties completely into what Vern is doing with his rocket, just as the age yeah. of balloon mania ties into what Poe is doing pre, with his balloons. Pre, rockets pre uh, cursor to plane today, so mm -hmm. you know, the, the Chinese. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it. But my point is, it is these things are very relevant to the era in which they spring. Sure. The fact that it is a 1865 post-American Civil War team of rocketeers firing a rocket to the moon, that matters. That would not have happened 30 years prior. The balloon thing would not have happened in the 16th or 30s or the 1730s because it didn't exist. You probably would have had a guy flying on, uh, you know, fake wings or something like that. Yes? To that question, why do so many of your presentations involve hot air balloons? I like balloons. <laughs> Yeah, cool. balloons can just keep going higher and higher, whereas airplanes could only go so high. <laughs> All right. There are these Apollo glasses. Oh, yeah. Is this, your, is this your adapter, Jonathan? Yes, it's the phone. So yeah, please take a glass on your way out. Uh, and then uh, some of us meet at the Coney Island on Van Dyke. Uh, never been, so. It's good. Uh, Coney Island. They got dessert and beer. Dessert and beer. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's good class. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Just, the, just that one, I think. No. John, think if you could get this off then. So have have a good night, everyone. Oh. Different than what people expect. Yeah. Uh,